thank you for coming to uh, the second lecture on the renormalization group. Let me quickly uh, recall what we discussed last time. Um, I gave some motivation and I discussed a little bit of what the kind of problems are that the renormalization group is relevant for. And in particular, in these lectures, I'm focusing on, on lattice spin systems. So lambda is a subset of, of say, the cubic lattice ZD, or if you, and this also in, includes continuum limits, if you think about of a lattice of a mesh size epsilon, and then uh, interest in the limit as epsilon goes to zero. And uh, the type of models I'll be discussing, um, they have an expectation which consists of a uh, uh, which if you write it down as here, it has some kind of a Gaussian free field type uh, term and uh, an interaction term. And a prototypical case you can keep in mind is an are easing type models or the what is called the phi four model where this potential term is, is a, a double well, which you can write as a quartic polynomial in the field phi. So, so it looks kind of like this. And what I'm, uh, what, then I explained that the, the main object uh, in the renormalization group study, which is the renormalized potential, um, whose exponential you obtain by convolving uh, a part of the Gaussian into uh, the exponential of the original potential. So we decompose, so we start with some decomposition of, uh, of a Gaussian measure, and there are different ways to do that. And then we convolve part of it into the exponential of the original potential, and that defines the exponential of the renormalized potential. And I hopefully con convinced you last time that this renormalized potential does have a nice structure, and uh, it would be interesting to understand um, uh, to understand it. And that's what mu much of the remaining lectures are about. And to appreciate what we can expect, and also uh, the success of the renormalization group, it's it's essential to uh, get some feeling of uh, perturbation theory. And I'm gonna try to keep this as, um, as uh, concise as possible, but I'll have to give you uh, some idea of how this works. Um, so, um, so what is perturbation theory about? Um, so, basically, um, most naively, uh, you, you, uh, you, could, you can uh, regard uh, the potential as a perturbation um, to the Gaussian measure. So we have some um, potential V naught, which in this case, I uh, focus, uh, focus on this prototypical phi four model. Uh, so sum over X and lambda, lambda and the lattice sites. And then we have, um, let's say a phi four potential like this. And um, uh, we're interested in understanding the renormalized potential. And uh, it, in fact, a lot of it um, uh, can be understood by making uh, the following for the moment ad hoc approximation, which I call the local or which is called the local uh, potential approximation. So basically, uh, we uh, the local potential approximation uh, pretends or uh, makes the ad hoc assumption that uh, VT of phi, the renormalized potential, has the same form as the original one, except that the parameters that appear in it are changed or renormalized. So, we assume the same, so we assume that the potential looks like, like the original one, except them changing G naught to GT and uh, nu naught to uh, nu T. And in principle, I could also at this point include uh, higher order terms, say phi to the six, phi to the eight, et cetera, or more nonlinear terms. I'm gonna get back to this later on, but for the moment, let me ignore these. Um, so I'm just gonna um, uh, um, hope that the, uh, it's a hope at this point, that the renormalized potential looks again, kind of like this. And, uh, and these, these coupling constants here would be called the renormalized. Coupling constants. Before explaining why uh, this is a good approximation or a problematic explanation, depending how you look at it, let me explain how you would compute 
the renormalized coupling constants because th uh, that explains um, uh, to a large extent the success of the renormalization group. Um, so the most naive approximation you can make is uh, what uh, would be called first order perturbation theory. And in first order perturbation theory, so recall the exact definition of the renormalized potential is the following. It's minus the log of the expectation with respect to a Gaussian measure with covariance uh, CT, where CT is this um, partly uh, decomposed uh, or, or this uh, regularized Gaussian measure. Um, and then uh, the exponential of the original potential phi plus zeta, uh, phi is fixed and the expe expectation acts on zeta. So this is the exact definition we made last time. And the most naive approximation is just to linearize all functions, all nonlinear functions that appear here, which are the exponential and the logarithm. And that leads to um, following formula. It's uh, just the expectation of V naught. And again, expectation acting on, on zeta. So if you do, if you compute this uh, for the choice of the phi four potential, uh, what you obtain is that the phi four term just reproduces. And uh, um, so uh, we're just computing moments of a Gaussian measure here. Um, and uh, so the Gaussian measure is zeta, you expand phi plus zeta to the four and phi plus zeta squared, you expand this all, uh, you get uh, various powers of phi that appear explicitly, This the phi to the four term is one of them. And then you get all these zeta terms, you just compute these Gaussian moments. And so again, you, you reproduce the phi squared term because the, those terms, when you expand everything just appear, but then you get a correction here, which is uh, in this case, three G naught, the covariance on the diagonal. Uh, so I'm writing, uh, zero, zero, really it's XX, but I'm always assuming that everything is translation invariant. And so let me just write zero, zero. And, and then there's also uh, maybe constant terms, which are independent of phi. And I try to systematically ignore these because they don't matter. Uh, really all that matters are somehow how the uh, renormalized potential um, varies as you, uh, for example, take derivatives with respect to phi or, um, uh, but, but not, the, um, but not the constant part will cancel out in, in all computations of relevance. Um, and so the first guess for uh, the um, renormalized coupling constant is that nu t is equal to nu naught and uh, no, g t is equal to g naught and nu t is uh, well approximately given by this. Uh, so far so good. Um, you could try to do this a little bit more precisely. Um, uh, and uh, the next order of pre uh, precision might would be called second order perturbation theory. Uh, and uh, well, in this case, instead of uh, linearizing all functions, we approximate all functions uh, 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 to, to second order. And um, well, if you do that, well, the linear term is of course the same. And then you get a, a, a quadratic term in V naught and the quadratic term looks like this, it's one half. Um, so this, this computation, this result is, is simply what you get by just linearizing everything um, uh, to or not, not linearizing, expanding everything to a second order and dropping all higher order terms. And so this is in fact the covariance term. It's the covariance of phi naught uh, with itself. So in other words, it's a, it's in fact a variance. Um, and again, the expectation acts on zeta and the semicolon here denotes covariance. Um, so to get an, uh, to get a feeling, let's also compute what this, um, uh, Rob, the second Rob, order Rob, correction. Rob, yes. Rob, since there are some pieces in the audience, uh, uh, could you remind us what, what you mean by covariance? Yes, uh, so truncated um, truncated expectation. Uh, okay. Let me. So this is um, the semicolon means uh, you take the expectation of the product and you subtract the product of expectations. Okay, sounds good. Thanks. Yeah, sorry about. It. 
uh, that. I, I hope it, that's clear now. Um, uh, the result will be familiar uh, of this. Uh, uh, I'm just going to write it down now, what, what this uh, expression amounts to. Um, uh, I'm not going to do this computation in detail because it's, it's just evaluating Gaussian moments. Um, but um, it, and the formula is, is uh, maybe if you see it for the first, well, if you've seen it before, it's, it's very familiar. If you're seeing it for the first time, it looks longer than you might have hoped. Uh, but it's very instructive, I think. So it's important, I think, to write down this formula. Uh, so what is this? Uh, so I'm, I'm computing this, this term here. Um, what are these terms? Well, again, so what, what, what are, are we doing? We're, we're substituting in the definition of V naught. So it's just this uh, quartic polynomial up there um, in both terms, expand it out, uh, collect all powers of phi. And uh, when they're powers of zeta, we evaluate the Gaussian moments. Um, uh, uh, for the physicists in the audience, we're computing Feynman diagrams or he, here, but I'm just gonna write down the result uh, because either you know how to do it this way or, or you don't. And if you don't, it's not an aspect I want to focus on in these lectures. Let me just write down uh, the result. Um, so what is the result? Um, um, so you, you'll get, uh, so, so this term, so there's a phi four in here, say phi four X and a phi four Y, uh, and then it's a one, quarter g, uh, one quarter g, and uh, then there's the quadratic term as well. And uh, the first term is summed over x, the second over y. So that's the two sums I put on the outside. Um, since we're taking a covariance or truncated expectation, uh, just the phi uh, four terms, they, the, uh, where both of them appear, they just cancel out because um, we're taking a difference here and the, those don't depend on the Gaussian. So the next term you get is, um, uh, G naught squared, the covariance between X and Y, and then there's a phi X cubed, phi Y cubed. Uh, and then you get a next term where um, um, you only have two powers of phi each. And if, so that would be nine over four. So these coefficients uh, are what you obtain if you work it out carefully and maybe you get different coefficients and then likely that's correct because uh, I have made a mistake, but um, uh, they look some some something like oops like this. Um, so this is phi x squared, phi y squared. Uh, the next one would be um, so there's, there's quite a few, but they're all straightforward. Uh, so um, x y uh, cubed, um, phi x phi y. Um, then there's so these are all the terms that appear from uh, from the g naught terms here, but then there is also the, the new naught terms and the cross terms. And so what, what are the cross? So let me first write down the cross terms. So that's one half G naught, new naught. So if, if, if you think this is a, a, is a, a bear with me, um, if, if you're not happy about this, this, uh, these many terms, uh, it'll soon, uh, get more conceptual again, but uh, it, um, it's an important uh, formula to look at to just uh, to get a feeling of what's going on. Um, so there would be a phi square term, and I think there's a final one, which is a new square term. Okay, so that's the result. That's the second order term. Looks a lot messier than the first one. And not only does it look a lot messier, there's also um, um, conceptually something that happened. Well, in first order perturbation theory, the local potential we started with reproduced itself. Um, it's not the case to second order. We get all sorts of uh, terms like phi x, uh, phi y, uh, where x and y are not at the same point. So they're not as local anymore as beginning. Um, it turns, it, it's better to write uh, these terms, for example, the phi x squared, phi y squared terms as uh, say phi x to the four plus the difference, which is uh, phi x squared times uh, uh, phi y squared minus phi x squared, or similarly, uh, 
phi x phi y would just become phi x squared plus uh, phi x phi y minus phi x. Um, so in other words, um, we'll try to um, make uh, the leading term local again. We write it as uh, say phi x to the four and then add the difference. Um, the, these difference terms here, um, uh, they're called the uh, gradient terms uh, where they involve differences. And in the local uh, potential approximation, we simply ignore them. Um, uh, so for the purpose of uh, what I'm explaining right now, this is just ad hoc. Um, let, um, this may be a little bit unsatisfactory, unsatisfactory but um, let me give you at least a, a small indication of why that might be reasonable. Um, um, but I'm not going to try to explain at this point uh, why, why, that, why, why you can do that. Um, under the Gaussian measure we're looking at, they have a small, much smaller variance than the local terms. Um, so if we look at, so for example, if CT dot um, is uh, the heat kernel, so say E to the T uh, delta, and we are on, on the lattice, uh, say on the unit lattice. Um, well, then if you look at uh, what happens on the diagonal, well, the heat kernel decays like uh, T to the minus uh, D over two or so um, uh, for large T. Um, well, if you're looking at gradients, so uh, this uh, gradient notation is now a discrete gradient, so a finite difference, uh, or you can directly look at the difference if you prefer. Well, these, these decay with better powers of T. So it's the T plus the number of derivatives uh, over two now. So it decays much faster. They have much smaller variance under the Gaussian measure. And um, um, uh, so for the, for the time being, I will simply ignore them. And uh, th this is something that, uh, that can be justified later, um, but uh, let me just ignore these for now. So that's the local ap potential approximation. So we simply drop the gradient terms right now. And then I'm gonna make a further um, ad hoc um, simplification. Uh, we'll also, I'll also drop the phi six terms. And then what we obtain is, well, we, we get uh, these uh, formulas um, uh, uh, how um, the couple, uh, then, then we are uh, under this, uh, under these ad hoc approximations, we get back something that looks as it did originally. So it's a local phi four potential, except that the coupling constants are uh, changed again. And, but now they're changed not only to first order, but to second order. And so how do they change? Um, I'll call, uh, need this equation later. So uh, the G coupling constant, so that's the one in front of the phi four term, well, the first order we saw it remains the same. And then there is a, a correction, which is not, turns out to be nine uh, G naught squared. And then there is a, uh, then it's multiplying something that's made out of the covariance. Um, that's the sum over all X. Uh, and then it's C zero T X squared, where remember CST is uh, the integral from S to T of uh, E to the U. Uh, I guess I haven't introduced this notation yet, but it's it's the difference of the integrated covariances. Um, um, so so that that would be the uh, equation to second order uh, derived in this way uh, for G, and uh, there's a similar equation for nu. Um, so this one has a linear term, which is uh, this one. Um, so here again, I'm writing only one argument rather than two arguments for the covariance because everything is translation invariant. So this uh, refers to the difference. Um, the next term looks like this. Uh, 
I will explain how to uh, interpret or what can be read off from these formula or what will ultimately uh, implied by these formulas in a second. Um, but um, so uh, let me just uh, write write down. Okay, so so this is the formula um, uh, to second order um, uh, according to the above procedure. Um, now I've written down the full formula starting from the coupling constants at scale zero uh, to go to coupling constant at scale t. Um, but uh, if we assume this approximation here, this one is valid, then could, we could have just uh, uh, applied the same procedure to go from not scale zero to t, but to go from scale s to t, where s is some intermediate scale between zero and t. That it should be, a, if this approximation is valid, it should give the same result. Um, so let's see what happens if you do that. Um, Well, of course, we get the same equations, except that zero is replaced by s. Um, so, going to make use of uh, having a tablet rather than a board here by just uh, duplicating these equations. And um, well, I'll put an s instead of a zero. Well leading too much here, but um, so um, an S. So this was CST um, three um, GS new S. Okay, so um, really this is the same equation, except I've applied it uh, from scale S to T rather than from scale zero to T. Um, so let me um, try to explain what can be learned from these equations. Um, I'm gonna give some, uh, this is not gonna be a complete explanation at this point, but I just want to give you a feeling of uh, uh, that these approximations do contain, or uh, these computations do contain interesting information. Um, so what can we learn from this? Um, uh, so, sorry, Roland. Can yes. you just say why you, you you drop the phi to the six terms? I, I, um, um, I, um, I prefer not to try to explain this right now um, because you um, um, maybe you shouldn't and uh, we'll see. Uh, so, uh, let me comment on this afterwards. Let me just okay. assume we do. And um, um, I, I tried to make some comments about this afterwards. And in fact, you cannot <laughs> drop it, <laughs> uh, but um, let, let me not, not go into that right now. And, and still uh, assuming that that's okay, uh, see what happens. Okay. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, a good, it's, it's a good point. Uh, as you saw, you uh, uh, spotted a, a weak um, a spot in, in what I'm trying to explain here. Um, so, uh, let me let me first try to see what kind of information you can extract from this. Oh, maybe before doing that, let me mention there. There's actually a, a, a very nice paper by uh, Giovanni Felder who um, uh, did what I kind of did right now, but he uh, dropped all gradient terms in a systematic way and uh, without making these approximations of uh, you know changing from uh, uh, dropping the phi six terms, etc. What you get is a one-dimensional nonlinear PDE. Uh, and you can essentially solve these, or um, you, you can uh, ex understand a lot of information from those. Uh, um, and it's a little bit more precise than the way I'm explaining it. But what I, the way I'm explaining it, it's it's a little bit quicker. Um, okay, okay. So what can we learn from these equations? Um, um, so let me. Um, well, first of all, um, I mentioned that um, 
let, let's start with the first one. Um, we, we have, um, so we're looking at these five, four type models and there are kind of two, in fact, I, uh, previously, I mentioned two five four models. I mentioned the lattice easing type model, um, uh, in particular in four dimensions or higher dimensions, um, and I, I mentioned the the continuum or ultraviolet problem, say of these five four uh, limits in the continuum in two and three dimensions. And for the continuum model, I so if I go back to the definition. So that, that was the definition for the continuum model. So instead of sums, we had sums rescaled by factors of epsilon to get uh, pro so that they look like a Riemann sum. Uh, there was one uh, somewhat, um, well, mysterious at that point feature, which were these divergent counter terms, which I told you, you have to add to get an interesting measure. Now, it turns out these divergent counter terms, they're exactly this term, and that term, that's it. Uh, if you're in two and three dimensions, in fact, in two dimensions, you only need to add the first term and two and three dimensions, or in three dimensions, you also need the second term. Um, that's all, that, those are the counter terms. Um, and so, for example, let me see, or let, let's see why that is. Uh, or if you take, again, I'm taking this heat kernel regularization, but now let's uh, take this heat kernel on the lattice of mesh epsilon. So. C dot is the uh, mesh epsilon regularized Laplacian. Well then, um, uh, the first term behaves like a log epsilon in two dimensions. So that's simply the log divergence of the Green's function in two dimensions, and it behaves like one over epsilon in three dimensions. That's simply, um, well, the one over X, uh, divergence of the Green's function in three dimensions um, uh, for any fixed T uh, independent of epsilon. Um, and I've done, I, I've uh, added the correct factors of the scaling by epsilon appropriately, but this is what you get. So these are the divergent counter terms. And similarly, this term here, uh, it's actually, it's bounded in two dimensions and it behaves like log epsilon in three dimensions. So that explains why you need to include it in three dimensions as well. Uh, and it turns out that's it. Uh, so these are simple, these are these somewhat mysteriously looking counter terms. You just compute them using this computation and this is exactly uh, what you need to do. Um, um, so I haven't told you how you justify it, but this sort of this back of the envelope calculation tells you what you need to do. Now. Um, if um, now for the four dimensional problem, you can also learn a lot from these equations. And um, um, so one um, feature that you might notice is that this orange term and this orange term, they're the same. I could have um, highlighted them in the equation from zero to uh, T rather than from S to T, but anyway, they're the same terms except the S. Yes. So these are these are the same terms here, and um, that that's not. I mean that that may be a coincidence how I did the computation, but it's actually not a. Um, it actually has um, implications. Um, um, in fact, so you have uh, they're the same, but the coefficients. In fact, well, they have different coupling constants in front of them, but they also have different numerical uh, uh, coefficients in front of them. And let me. At this point, just mention this as a remark. Uh, uh, so if you consider a lattice phi four model, and the same should be true for easing in phi four in, in four dimensions. Uh, so this is, this is known if, if G is small, uh, but it's uh, conjecturally true for easing as well. So in this case, uh, a interesting uh, physical quantity is what's called the susceptibility. Um, uh, if you haven't seen this before, uh, don't worry about it. It's simply the sum of this uh, two-point correlation function. And we're looking at this uh, for parameters where this new critical, uh, where this new parameter is close to its critical value, but we, we're adding uh, a little epsilon to it. 
Well, it turns out, well, it's known that this has to diverge and it diverges like epsilon inverse uh, log and four dimensions. There is uh, what is called a logarithmic correction and the exponent is one third. And one third is uh, the same as three over nine and how it arises is the ratio of these two coefficients there. Um, so this is a known, this is, a, it doesn't follow uh, as quickly as this, but really the essential part is that the ratio of these coefficients in, uh, in perturbation theory gives this exponent. Um, and I've already mentioned that for the continuum five fork problem in dimension two and three, um, the counter terms, um, which I denoted by a epsilon of lambda. So lambda was more or less the same as G before, um, are exactly the orange terms. Um, okay, so uh, this, I mean, I wrote this down because I, I think it's a sort of, uh, exemplifying the uh, the extremely uh, nice heuristic um, power of the renormalization group. These simple computations tell you a lot of uh, uh, physically uh, relevant information. But uh, let me also draw some. Uh, so this this is, I guess, is a positive um, a positive news. These simple computations give you all these all these interesting facts, or the, all these nice things, um, but let me also draw uh, three more. I, I want to draw three lessons from, from this computations, which um, will tell us we have to be a little bit careful. And really that's, that's, that's why it's not so straightforward as it may look at this point. I wrote down these things and uh, they turn out to be true, but they do, don't turn out to be uh, uh, um, easy to justify. Um, um, uh, right away. So, okay, let me start with the first lesson. So, so yeah, I have yes. a, another naive question, if I may. So I, I misunderstood, I saw the counter terms, uh, you said were the, the yellow terms with the log yes. one over epsilon dimension two, and then the additional yes. subtilting dimension three. And then you, you wrote that uh, the counter terms- Oh, well, sorry, it's, the, it's not the orange terms, the yellow terms, thank oh, you. Okay. okay. <laughs> the yellow terms very good and in fact so that with the opposite sign right you you put the opposite of these counter terms into the new knot and then it cancels these 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 sort of divergent terms and it turns out uh, that's all you need to cancel to to you know get rid of these uh, infamous infinities here um okay so let me try to draw uh, three lessons from this computation uh the first one I'm focusing on this four dimensional case on the lattice, on the unit lattice. And uh, let's say, so CT is um, the, for concreteness, I'm always using this heat kernel regularized um, covariance, uh, but it really doesn't matter. Um, uh, and so now Lep this is the unit lattice Laplacian. Um, well then, uh, this um, term ctx squared, the orange term, in other words. Well, uh, well, it's the orange term if we set uh, s equal to zero. So maybe I should yeah. write zero <laughs> here. So I'm for Roland just to make sure we cannot yes. see any difference between your yellow and orange. Yeah, maybe, oh. maybe red and this. You, oh, you can't see it in the on the screen? No. Okay, so let me use a, try to use a different color. So I'm gonna change orange to, uh, I'm gonna remove all orange and I'm gonna try a different color. Um, how about purple? Uh, how's this? Yeah, this works. <laughs> this works. Okay, so these, um, um, so we have purple and yellow now. So anyway, so this is just a purple term. 
if you like. And uh, well, in four dimensions, uh, this diverges like some constant log t uh, for large t. Um, so this is a, um, another divergence that you formally see uh, in these equations. Now it's not happening at short distances. So in this limit, epsilon goes to zero, but epsilon is fixed to one, but it happens at uh, large, uh, sort of a large distances when T becomes large. So this is what's uh, called the infrared problem uh, rather than the ultraviolet problem. And let's see what happens if we use these two equations. So one from zero to T and, and the other one from S to T. So if we, so this equation would say that GT should be uh, G naught minus, and then there was this coefficient, so some constant, so C always denotes a constant that may change from line to line, log T G naught squared. So that, that would be the first equation. While the other one, the one from S to T, um, gives GT is maybe GS minus some other constant. And this constant is roughly uh, log T uh, minus log S. So if you change T and S with a constant ratio, um, so say T is um, two times S, well then this is just some universal constant that independent of T and S. You get, this is S. On the first line, you get an equation with a divergent coefficient. And the second line, you get an equation with a coefficient of order one. If, if, this equa if the first equation, I mean, the first equation really only has a chance to be uh, useful if G naught is extremely small, has to beat log T. It's not the regime we're interested in, in the infrared for the long distance problem. Um, the second one doesn't have this problem. So if you iterate, and so I told you, instead of going from scale zero to T right away, you could go from zero to T and uh, well, in steps, you change uh, zero to two, uh, then two to four, et cetera. So if we iterate the second equation, uh, and let's say with ST is uh, are given and say powers of two, um, uh, well, then you obtain the following equation, gj plus one uh, is uh, gj minus some constant gj squared. And this one um, uh, behaves uh, roughly like uh, one over j. And particularly if you start with a g naught not too large, it goes to zero, like one over J. Um, this is something you, you can't infer from the first equation. So of course, so this is the, I mean, so this is the first lesson I would say is that perturbation theory um, must be renormalized. It's not a good idea to, uh, well, use perturbation theory, starting from the initial coupling constant scale zero to directly go to scale T. If you do this in steps, um, this is a, a much better idea. And I, I've used discrete steps here, but it's actually an instructive exercise to do this continuously. I've, I've explained this uh, discrete steps rather than continuously because it's, a, it's, a, it's easier to explain. Uh, but uh, it's a good exercise to just try to solve the Polchinski equation uh, with this uh, formal local uh, potential approximation. Uh, and, um, and when you do that, you have to take into account the phi to the sixth term, Christoph. Um, uh, if, if, if you try to say, uh, assume that VT at every, for every T is, has this local potential form as a, say, a formal power series and powers of phi, and try to solve the Polchinski equation, you'll see the phi to the sixth term does play a role. So, okay, so this is the, the first lesson. Uh, discrete or continuous steps, uh, perturbation theory is really only, uh, can only really be good if you, if you use it in a uh, renormalized way. So from one scale to the next rather than in one shot. Uh, 
Um, okay, so that that's um, lesson one. Um, there's a set, there's um, there's two more lessons. Um, so lesson two is um, well, if you um, take uh, the, diff, uh, the second order approximation I've wrote down literally, say this is the one, right? This is the formula I've wrote down, the big one. If you take it lit literally, you're running into some issues. Um, why is that? Well, if we do the local potential approximation, say this term here, the yellow term, the phi cubed, phi cubed term is essentially phi to the six, becomes a phi to the sixth term. The coefficient is, is uh, negative. If you put this into the exponential, you're trying to integrate e to the phi to the six with respect to a Gaussian measure. Uh, this is not integrable. So you're running into an issue there. Um, uh, if you take this approximation literally and try to iterate it, you get stuck at the first step because the result isn't integrable. Um, uh, there's, two, there's other ways to look at um, the same problem. Uh, another way to say this or uh, related to is this it, is, is that clear, is it clear that phi to the six will appear with the coefficient? Was yeah, it will co it will appear with a coefficient that has the bad sign. But is this is it has some physical meaning that this happens like this? I, I don't think so. I mean, I don't think so. Um, I think the meaning is that um, the way I've wrote down this formula, this perturbation theory formula is um, is really only, uh, so this is uh, what is called the large field problem, that really this is a good approximation when phi is small, but when phi is, where it does look like a phi to the six if you want, but if if uh, if if you take, uh, it, it's not, this perturbation theory approximation has no chance to be really good if phi is large. Um, even if phi to the six came out with a good sign, you would still not like uh, this. Yeah, I mean, in some sense, I mean, I, I, I wrote down uh, an exact formula for VT in terms of this Polchinski or Gaussian convolution formula. And from this formula, you can read off without knowing anything that the large phi behavior is Gaussian because you're taking uh, something and convolving it with a Gaussian. So its tail is going to be Gaussian. So e to the minus uh, v has, will have a you, Gaussian you, tail. Is, could you explain if this is an important point? Could you, if, if this is important, uh, could you explain Well, this yeah. Um, so let me go back to last time. So I wrote down this exact formula for VT. Right, and it has, uh, so this, this formula here, right? The, this formula is exact and there's no problem with it. It, ma it makes sense. Um, um, whenever, it's, so I'm always in a finite volume and everything is a finite dimensional integral, it makes sense. Um, and so does the Polchinski equation. Um, and it also gives you some information which tells you that Qualitatively, this is not a statement that in this way follows uniformly in the volume, but qualitatively it tells you that, well, the right-hand side um, as a function of phi will, will look more or less Gaussian because, well, you're convolving a Gaussian with something that has a much faster decay. So for example, if you convolve a Gaussian with a, a function that is say has compact support, and e to the minus phi four has much more compact support than a Gaussian, right? It decays much faster. Well, then you again have a Gaussian tail. Um, maybe I uh, maybe let me move on a bit, and I, I I can explain this a bit more in the in the break if you like. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, but so any case, so if you do this perturbation theory calculation, you run into a problem, which shouldn't be a problem, but the way this computation is done, it is a problem. Um, so even if perturbation theory is renormalized, we have there's this large field problem. And there's different ways to look at it. Uh, another way to see that something is, is not, uh, well, that, that you get at some issues from the large fields is to notice that the function where, well, g from the coupling constant 
uh, say to just let's do a one dimensional integral, say a one dimensional integral. Uh, so it's a one dimensional phi Gaussian integral, and you integrate, say, this. Well, this is clearly not an analytic function in G because it's actually infinite when G is negative. Um, uh, so it's, it's infinite for G negative. And this perturbation theory calculation where we've essentially assumed we can expand everything into power series and really uh, this, this uh, tells us, well, we, we cannot um, ex expand it naively as a power series uh, uh, round, uh, round zero. Um, another way to look at this, you can look at the growth of uh, moments. So if you want to try to expand the phi to the four, e to the minus phi to the four into a power series, and then compute the Gaussian moments, you see that the moments grow too quickly. So if you look at, say, the Gaussian moment, um, doing a Gaussian integral, and then I'm computing, say, um, well, whatever term you'd have if you expand e to the g uh, phi to the four. So here I have uh, g to the n. So these are the terms. This would have to be summed over n. Um, phi to the four n, right? If you compute this Gaussian moment, it's just a single real variable phi. Well, this behaves well. You have a one over n factorial that that came from the uh, expansion of the exponential, and then maybe you have the explicit prefactor um, one fourth g to the n. Uh, but now you have this Gaussian moment of uh, of order four n, and Gauss, Gaussian moments they grow like so. This would be four n minus one, this double factorial, so just the odd terms. Um, and well, th this is uh, well grows like n factorial squared. We have one over n factorial to compensate from the exponent uh, from the expansion of the exponential, but we have n factorial squared here. So there's no way we can do the sum. And of course we shouldn't be because we know it's not analytic. Um, but uh, this is another uh, incarnation of, of, of this issue. Um, if you try to do this, the moments grow quickly. And um, what is the lesson of this? Well, the lesson of this is that perturbation theory for a model like this, like this uh, bosonic phi four theory, well, you have to be careful. Um, I would summarize the lesson as perturbation theory must be truncated carefully. You cannot um, expand it into series. And uh, this is uh, well one instance of um, um, what is known as, as the large field problem. Um, and finally, there's a third lesson. Um, so this is, uh, uh, what's the third lesson? Well, the third lesson is if even if we ignore the large field issue and uh, we take the point that uh, we renormalize perturbation theory, so we only use it from one scale to the next. Um, and we assume, uh, say, our V has a, has a local form as originally. Um, well, then if you try to well truncate perturbation theory as suggested by the last, um, uh, by lesson two, say um, we try to write down, so this is the approximation we used for um, first order perturbation theory, say, uh, so this, this is the approximation we made. And where we try to, well, use this as an approximation and uh, so formally, this is of order v squared. Um, 
But as we saw above, this order V squared formally is, is not only very non-uniform in phi, you, you cannot have such an estimate that would be uniform in phi. But um, also in lambda, the size of the system. If I just write down this formula, you get an est naively, you get an estimate where that would uh, depend very badly on lambda. And well, what is the lesson here is that what perturbation theory must be localized. Um, it's not going to work well if we try to uh, um, apply it to the whole system at once like this, uh, where in this way we'd get a, a, a very bad volume dependence in the remainder term. But um, uh, we should try to explain uh, to apply it more locally, where um, um, so where roughly speaking, this uh, error of order lambda would be replaced by something that depends on the scale T. Um, so roughly speaking, lambda in the error should get replaced by maybe uh, T over D over two um, for the heat kernel. Um, and um, so these are, okay. I think these are three instructive lessons that one can take from perturbation theory, despite its uh, so, uh, enormous success and uh, uh, it, the, of the predictions it makes. Um, there's issues if you try to take it literally. And, and also, well, we've already discussed this point. Uh, I think it's interesting that, well, despite uh, these these problems or issues. Um, the way we define VT makes perfect sense, right? Is um, so these approximations um, say it's perfectly well defined by the Polchinski equation, uh, and its exponential is integrable. It's also not a problem uh, all in whenever we're in finite volume here. So really, um, we ran into issues uh, by trying to use these perturbation theory approximations. At the same time, I've perhaps convinced you, or at least that was my goal, that perturbation theory is an extremely good approximation because, um, well, for the reasons I mentioned in this remark, it gives the correct results. Say, if we're interested in this critical, this logarithmic correction for the susceptibility in four dimensions, this gives the right exponent. You can just read it off. If you're interested in the counter terms for the continuum problem, you just read them off. So there's clearly something uh, correct about it. Um, but we have to be careful when justifying it. Um, okay, so, so that is um, what I'd like to see as a perturbation theory and its problems. And well, the remainder of these lectures, well, is trying to explain how to get around some of these problems. And I will begin uh, after the break uh, with um, one of these problems. And um, I, I'll not, ex um, instead of explaining how to get around these problems, I'll tell you about um, a different class of models, which is uh, um, e essentially equally interesting or also very interesting, where this, where one of the problems doesn't appear. And I, so those are models of fermions. And uh, I think it's instructive to compare how, why they don't appear. And um, those, those describe interesting models anyway. So I'll take this as an opportunity to explain how, how those work. And um, um, this will be an, appli an application I will keep in mind. So. After the, after the break, I will explain uh, that part and essentially gets around to around the problem posed by lesson two. Okay, thank you. Maybe we, I mean, are there questions on this first part of uh, the talk maybe?
Yes, I, I have a small one. Could, could you uh, explain shortly what you meant by a, a perturbation theory must be localized? Um, yes. Um, well, this is something I'll, I'll explain in much more detail uh, next lecture. This is going to be all what next lecture is about. Um, but what I'm saying is that this part of this, so the formula I've wrote down um, under lesson three, right? This Taylor formula, if you just write down this Taylor formula, formally it's V squared, but the error of the, well, you can write down the error of estimate, Taylor's error estimate, right? Uh, um, um, you'll not get a good estimate that's uniform in phi, but if you apply the say on a block, of a of a fixed size or say a finite dimensional size, say, uh, then uh, you would not care about uh, the size of the block, right? Because um, we do not want to this error estimate to depend on the system size. Uh, th that would not be good because we we want to get an estimate that's uniform in in lambda. But if you apply it to say a single block um, of a fixed size, well then that uh, wouldn't be a problem, right? Because the size of the block doesn't um, it's fixed. Now, by localized, essentially what one can do is uh, one applies it not um, on, um, on, on the full volume, but on a block at the right scale. And then it turns out the uh, sort of this volume dependence works out correctly. So that's what I mean by localized. So you can use a Taylor approximation like this essentially, but you don't apply it to, uh, to the full um, potential, but only after uh, localizing the potential and uh, applying it to part of it. Okay, thanks. So can you, can you say, you know, what is your intuition about the Gaussian behavior of your file? Because you said some words uh, like convolve this with that, but... Okay, well, uh, okay, all I... Um, yes, yeah, so all I wanted to, I meant, yeah. Uh, say if we look at this formula here, right? Yeah, look at that formula, okay. And then... So if we look at the right-hand side, what what does it mean if we write it out? Um, so it's uh, the Gaussian measure is say e to the minus um, phi minus zeta, or say, so it's one half phi minus zeta. Then there's the covariance inverse phi minus zeta, and then e to the minus v naught of uh, zeta. Uh, that's that's what the right-hand side is. Well, no, because v, v naught includes also quartic pieces and so on. So where- Yes, where uh, I've written what v naught is, uh, but- um, But, but I, don't, I don't see how at the formal level, what you have there transforms into what you have here, so- so, for example, okay, so there is a piece phi to the fourth. Yes, that's the v naught. The v naught is the phi to the four. Let me okay. Let me write that. Let me write down phi to the four there. Let's just do a one-dimensional integral rather than uh, because this message. So I'm dropping the ct here. Yeah. Uh, so it's uh, so the first the Gaussian term is just going to be this, and then I'm going to have maybe. Uh, Phi plus zeta, I think, to, to be correct. Uh, oh, it's just uh, zeta. But why zeta? You had there in the- Well, there's two ways to look at it, right? I mean, you can write, this is equal to e to the minus one half zeta squared, e to the minus one quarter g phi plus zeta to the four. Is equal. Okay, so you made the change of variable. Okay, fine. Yeah, uh, and uh, well, uh, one may be more useful than the other. If you want to just see that this behaves for large phi, essentially like a, a Gaussian. Uh -huh. Well, then um, you look at the first equation. You look at the first equation. The first line. You look at the first line, and then you yeah. say, okay. Okay, I guess I agree. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, in the end, I mean, we we cannot use it like this because this is very qualitatively. We all all. I mean, this this works for a fixed variable or 
but uh, we want all statements, we want a uniform in all volume and cutoffs, et cetera. So, but it, it gives you the, I mean, it, it conveys the point that it's easy to see there, there, there is no integrability problem in the end. It's just the way we were trying to take out the, the what should be the right approximation uh, what seems to create one. And, but, but that approximation is really only a good one um, when phi is small, right? It's a kind of a Taylor approximation. And if you, uh, I mean, if you do that with a huge argument, it's not, not going to be very good, especially if yeah. you have a function yeah, that's I, not I, analytic. I understand. I understand. I understand. The reason why I was asking, insisting on this point is that people who do these functional RG computations, they yeah. do actually see that their effective potential becomes quadratic at large phi. Okay. Which, which agrees with what, what you're saying here. That's yeah, I see. Um, yeah, that's that's very interesting. Um, that's, that's for, for rhetoric. Well, usually they do rhetoric, but I, I think it should be equivalent, more or less, morally equivalent. Yeah, I, I think so. Um, you so, should be able to go from one to the other. Um, so it's kind of, uh, yeah, so what you're saying suggests that there might be some actually general result of this kind. That, yeah, I mean, the one I mentioned, I think is much, uh, much uh, less deep than uh, what you're um, uh, referring to, I, I think. Probably what you're referring, to, I mean, I think the statement you're referring to is, is probably that's uh, something that's going to be valid uniformly in the volume, et cetera, right? I mean, yeah. the way I explained this, that qualitatively it looks quadratic for large phi, I mean, the coefficient in front of the square uh, would probably be um, volume dependent uh, from, from the soft argument. <laughs> Right, um, so it's really not something that you'd be very interested in. Um, um, I I only mention it as as an explanation that really the integrability is not an issue. It's um, it's the way we're trying to approximate and then integrate. Okay, but ultimately that's what we want to do. So uh, so there's this issue to be faced. <laughs> Um, <laughs> See, you, you, do, you never explained what you want to do. Like you, you, you are saying, okay, we want these approximations and the approximations. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, I, I want to explain. Okay, it's it's uh, maybe a good point. So I, I want to explain roughly how. I mean, so I explained various um, results. You can um, you can understand. Uh, for example, this critical phi four model in uh, four dimensions. I'm I'm not going to explain this uh, in uh, in detail, but I want to explain how um, um, how you could get at such a result with these these methods, um, uh, or um, or these other other problems I mentioned here. Um, what I'm planning on doing in the last lecture is. Um, um, is uh, explaining how um, a version of of uh, of this type result uh, works in uh, in the setting of um, of the zero state pots model, mm -hmm. which uh, behaves in much uh, in many way, ways like like the Heisenberg model. Perturbatively, they they I think equivalent. More or less. Can I ask also a question about the philosophy? Yes. So, so you, so we are we are trying to do RG, and you're you motivated, okay, that you have to do perturbation theory, and then we some, should somehow improve on perturbation theory. Uh, so that, yes. So that the error term is under control. Yes. Yeah, so basically, we want to understand, say, this renormalized potential. Um, 
uh, perturbation theory gives you a very good uh, intuition of how it behaves. Um, but there are some issues in taking it too literally, um, or at least um, we we'll run into some issues if we try to do that. But what and, I was just wondering is that, okay, the, the way you presented the need to do perturbation theory was a bit strange because you kind of said, okay, look, it gives the right answers, so there has to be some truth to it, so we just have to find a way to fix it. <laughs> Isn't there some way to justify, I mean, there must be some way to justify that what you're going to do is a good thing to do without yeah i mean that that'll i mean right i mean i haven't reached that point yet uh yeah, where um, yeah. yeah i mean but but i mean clearly uh the approach to this um i mean you, you can try to solve the polchinski equation from from scratch right i mean you could just try to uh, do that. Unfortunately, um, what do you do? <laughs> right? It's uh, um, it looks like a horrible infinite dimensional equation or very high dimensional equation. So uh, we we can understand some qualitative facts, like say this Gaussian tail. But really, we want to understand uh, the behavior of these related models. So how do we learn anything about it? Oh, and perturbation theory is despite its problems uh the best uh the best guess right i mean it's uh well as you know much better than i do it's extremely successful right um i i have nothing just perturbation theory i was just wondering if there was some uh, how do you see that it's there was another I mean, way to argue that it should uh so, so, so what you're saying is that there is there's going to be some way to fix up perturbation theory. Yes. So that the error term is under control. Yes. And the question is, like, is it a priori obvious that this way should exist, or? Well, you know, you're going to present some way that 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 you guys developed and so on, but. Is it? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Well, how, how surprising it is that some way to fix perturbation theory exists. Is it? Is it? Well, I. Um. I mean, it's. Uh, it's hard to say. It's more of a philosophical question, right? Yeah, um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, um, maybe I, uh, maybe I, we can try to discuss it again later on when, yeah, uh, for, um, uh, it might, might be easier to come back then. Um, I also have another tech question about terminology. So you mentioned this localization. So the localization that you mentioned, uh, you mean, you uh, that perturbation theory has to be localized yeah so this localization in your sense is it related somehow to extracting a local part of a non-local operator or is it something else um i think so yeah i think so um yeah that's yeah that's just for me to follow but. yeah i mean somehow we only want to use perturbation theory um, for the relevant parts, if you want. Um, and for all the irrelevant parts, um, um, we'll try to get around using perturbation theory directly. Yeah. But I think it'll become clearer. Not, okay. not today, but next, next time. Okay, thanks. Okay, so maybe is the time we... for me to continue? Sounds good. Right. Thanks. Okay, so in in the second part of today's lecture, I want to explain not how to solve the three problems I um, um, 
I emphasized, but I want to uh, uh, briefly discuss uh, fermionic fields or Grassmann variables, which, which are interesting anyway. And they also have the advantage that one of the issues doesn't appear there. So it's a good uh, it's a good play uh, it's a good uh, context to think about these these things and um, uh, if you have never seen them they may look a little bit mysterious at first but they're actually much easier to work with than uh, what I've explained with uh, so far so let me quickly give a crash course on this um, so we start with uh, I'm going to call omega uh, um, and I'll you'll see in a second that this is, uh, it's, it's very elementary to understand what this is. So omega is, uh, is the exterior algebra or Grassmann algebra. Um, with generators, uh, which I call psi x and psi x bar. Um, and uh, as always, we're on a finite set, so x is a x is a lambda, which is finite. Um, so all this means is that while well, you have these symbols psi x and psi x bar, and they all anti-commute. So psi x uh, psi y is minus psi y uh, psi x, uh, and uh, the same if you add bars to any of these. Uh, these bars, they really only have notational meaning. That's just to distinguish uh, two copies of um, uh, um, um, two copies of the generators. So, and uh, in fact, so to make this even more explicit, uh, I can also write uh, maybe psi x bar as uh, psi x bar, where x uh, uh, X bar is in a second copy of lambda, which I call lambda bar. Um, uh, so this is the exterior algebra, Grassmann algebra, and uh, it's finite dimensional. Um, any element is, um, so in particular, um, maybe let me mention every element squares to zero. So this is, uh, the square is uh, psi x psi x, which is by anti-community minus psi x psi x, which so it has to be zero. Um, and uh, so every every uh, f and omega is, is simply a polynomial formally in, uh, in the psi x and psi x bar, and they could have, let's say, a real or complex coefficients. Um, and uh, we write, uh, we sometimes, uh, we'd like to think of these psi x and psi x bars as, as the analog of a probabilistic field. And so um, sometimes write, write this like this, but it really just means that some formal non commutative polynomial in these symbols. Um, uh, so sometimes write this like this, but uh, let me mention maybe You have to be a bit careful about the order of these symbols. So you have to fix them in some way, for example. Um, now, um, why are we interested in, in these Grassmann variables? Well, there's various reasons. Um, uh, on the one hand, if you're uh, studying quantum field theory of fermions rather than bosons, um, uh, they arise. Um, uh, the, you'll see a bit more complicated version than the, the ones I explained here, uh, but the concepts are the same. Um, and it turns out they also have a lot of, uh, well, they arise naturally in, in various models um, that I'm more interested in. Um, that is not to say I'm not interested in the other ones as well, but uh, sort of probabilistic models like self-voiding walks and the zero state pots model, which I alluded to before, et cetera. Um, uh, they, they appear in probabilistic models, dimer coverings, et cetera. Um, I, I'll give an example in a second, um, but let me just um, give a few uh, uh, basic notions. Um, uh, what you can do with them. There is um, 
uh, the Grassmann derivative. Um, basically trying to imitate the usual notions of uh, calculus. So if we uh, take uh, write deep psi and it acts on an element, say psi uh, f. So this would be element in omega by just uh, canceling the factor of psi. Uh, if f doesn't contain psi itself, if it did, uh, well, that factor would be zero anyway. Um, if f does not contain a factor of psi. Um, so in other words, what you do is you have this formal polynomial, you commute psi to the left, possibly pick up some signs along the way, and then you cancel this factor. That's what the Grassmann derivative does. And then there's the Grassmann integral. Uh, sorry, maybe I, I missed something, but if the psi is say uh, inside the polynomial, but not on the left. Yes, then um, you have to commute it to the left. So in every okay. factor, you have to okay. commute this psi to the left uh, before canceling it. Okay. And nice. so that would uh, pick up some signs. Uh, yeah. Um, and well, the Grassmann integral um, is denoted, well, I'm going to denote it like this. I'm uh, going to write an integral sign and maybe uh, deep psi, deep psi bar. But instead of writing D, I'm, I like this notation where it's actually a derivative because it turns out the Grassmann integral is just a derivative. It's just, um, um, oops, deep psi one, deep psi one bar, deep psi n, deep psi n bar of f. Uh, if, um, say, our finite set lambda is just one through n. And um, so we apply it to some element. And what this does, it just extracts the top degree coefficient. So every element, uh, I mean, every monomial uh, generated by the psi and psi bars uh, has maximal degree 2n, because by anti-commutativity, you can't have two factors of psi. So um, uh, and there is up to order, there's a unique such element, uh, and that just extracts that top degree coefficient. So this is just a real number if we're looking at the Grassmann algebra over the real numbers. Um, um, so simply extracts. Top degree coefficient. Um, and well, then we can also define a Grassmann Gaussian integral, and that gets us closer to uh, the. Um, so it, it's a little, if you see this the first time that the integral is a derivative, uh, may sound, may seem a little bit uh, uh, disturbing, but uh, we'll see that this uh, notion is uh, actually has good justification. Um, It'll re it really behaves uh, very much like an integral. You can integrate by parts. You can all the, do all the usual things, sometimes picking up an extra minus. But other than that, it, it works, works very much analogously. Um, so then we also have the um, the Grassmann Gaussian integral. Um, and so we, uh, there's a more general case than the one I'm considering, but uh, for my purposes, I'm fixing a covariance matrix C, which is symmetric, positive definite. And again, for simplicity, I'm assuming C is strictly positive definite for the definition, but again, it uh, doesn't matter. Um, and then I'm um, gonna use the same notation as, as before. Um, uh, expectation uh, C, and in this case, it would be given, you just take the, the Grassmann integral, and then you take a Gaussian factor, which uh, looks like this. So it looks like a complex Gaussian if you want, but, um, and then you uh, divide by uh, the normalization. Um, so that would be the, Grassmann Gaussian integral with covariance C. And um, 
um, there are some instructive exercises, observations one can make, just like the normalization of a usual Gaussian integral is the determinant of the covariance. It turns out that um, the normalization of the Grassmann Gaussian integral is the inverse of a determinant. So this normalization I wrote here is uh, simply the determinant of C inverse. And um, well, um, this is, uh, well, remember the Gaussian, the Grassmann Gaussian integral just extracts the top degree term from, from this monomial here. So here I've written the exponential, it's just defined by the formal power series mm -hmm. and it truncates after finitely many terms since the algebra is finite. So it's actually a much easier object, it's a finite polynomial. And um, so it just extracts the top degree coefficient and uh, well, you may see why you get a determinant, but uh, it's not hard to check. It just comes out of the, uh, from the anti-commutativity. It's sort of the definition of the determinant if you, if you want, or one way to define the determinant. Um, and then you can also compute moments. Um, so just like we can compute moments um, of a Gaussian integral using the Wick formula, uh, which I haven't wrote, written down, but there's a fermionic version. Um, so say we want to compute, uh, so only the even moments again uh, make sense. So say I want to compute a moment like this. Um, well, turns out this is given by the sum of all permutations, uh, sigma and sp uh, minus one uh, to the to the sign of the permutation, and then the product of x i y uh, sigma i. Um, so in other words, it's the determinant of the matrix. C X I uh, Y I where I runs from one to P well, I and J. I uh, it's just that determinant. So this is parallel to say the moments of a complex Gaussian, which are given by a permanent, the same formula without the minus one to the sigma. Um, now the minus one to the sigma. Well, they may, if you see this for the first time, they may seem like, uh, well, there could be a cause of a nuisance, but it turns out determinants are infinitely nicer than permanents. And um, I, I'll explain this in just a second. A lot of the, basically this large, you, you can, but, okay, I'll explain that in a second, but let me first um, uh, say a few more words about this. So I have explained this formal structure. You can define this Grassmann Gaussian integral and, um, I've already mentioned that it appears um, in the context of, um, say, fermionic uh, field theories. Uh, here's a, a, maybe the simplest probabilistic example. So I'm just going to. Sorry, Roland. Uh, yes. But this fermionic Vick formula, so not only with respect to the normal Gaussian case, there is a minus one. But yes. So you kind of consider the psi bar and the psi to. It's like a complex Gaussian. Ah. It's like a it's like a complex Gaussian. It's a okay. analogous the minus if you do a complex Gaussian, you have the same formula as a, with a minus one. So yeah. Okay, okay, good. Okay. Thank you. Um so I already I'm not gonna discuss applications to say um uh, uh fermionic condensed matter or um dimers, which are more related to that. But let me uh, just give an example, uh, simple probabilistic model, which is that of spanning trees. So if you take lambda to be the graph Laplacian, on, on a graph lambda, so lambda is, uh, is a graph, I'm usually thinking of a box, but it doesn't matter. Um, So this is as before. Uh, well then, well, the determinant of this graph Laplacian is zero, um, as is apparent from this form definition. Um, uh, 
um, it turns out in this case, the right thing to do, or one of the things to uh, fix this is just remove one row and column and that has a natural interpretation. I'm not gonna go into this very much, but let me just say, let's put a zero here um, uh, to mean um, we remove one row and column, say the first row and column. Doesn't matter which one. Um, then uh, this is uh, the matrix tree theorem. Kirchhoff, uh, 19th century mathematics, um, states that the determinant is the number of uh, spanning trees on lambda. So uh, it's a subgraph without any cycles and the number of such. Uh, if, if you're not um, interested in this example, it's, it's just a quick example. I, I just want to exemplify that um, it does describe interesting uh, things as well. And this is one, maybe the simplest one you could uh, give. So the determinant describes, uh, is ca just counts the number of spanning trees. This is so Kirchhoff, uh, 18 something, I guess. Um, um, and um, um, if you compute the um, uh, the moment, say i to p, and let's say psi x i uh, y i psi x i minus y i. So this is a certain moment of of these differences. Uh, that is exactly the probability that an edge that the edges x i and y i uh, for i from one to p are in a uniformly chosen uh, spanning tree. Um, so somehow the normalization constant just counts the number of spanning trees. These these moments uh, express the probabilities that you have these edges in it. So it's just an example that uh, even though these uh, uh, so. These models also describe uh, interesting probabilistic or uh, models. Um, in this case, it's just these free firm, these free fermionic variables describe a uniform spanning tree. Okay, uh, so this uh, this is just an example of what how you can interpret these things. Um, but let me go back to the um, um, properties of this fermionic Gaussian measure. Um, um, so when we define the um, effective put or the renormalized potential, or we did this by taking the exponential of the original potential and convolving. it. So we can also do a convolution here. So it's the fermionic convolution. How do you do it? Um, well, well, one way to do it for a regular Gaussian, well, we take uh, two copies of the variables. You take two sets of variables. You keep one fixed and you integrate over the other one. So maybe let me denote by omega squared, something like that, two copies of omega. Um, and uh, so that, in other words, we again have a Grassmann algebra that has generators, psi x, psi x bar, and then we have two more copies and I'm gonna note them maybe psi x and psi x bar. And uh, we can define, so as before I used the Gaussian expectation to only act on the zeta variables, uh, where we define this, I define this expectation to act only on the size. Um, so in other words, if F is an element of this, uh, Grassmann algebra generated by these uh, four symbols, then this is just the determinant of C times uh, the Grassmann Gaussian integral in Psi. Uh, so it would be uh, like this. And then F. And now this isn't a real number, but this is again an element in the Grassmann algebra generated by the Psi and Psi bars. Maybe like this. If F 
Oops. Um, and, uh, and so the convolution is now defined. The convolution is defined. We start with F uh, psi, we replace every psi by psi plus psi and every, um, uh, yeah, every psi by psi plus uh, psi. And so this is in uh, the algebra generated by um, the psi's. So we start with an element of the, uh, Uh, we start with an uh, element of the algebra generated by the psi's and we again get one by this convolution. So, and that happens by taking two copies, taking the sum and then integrating over one of them. So it's completely analogous to uh, the usual Gaussian convolution. And in fact, you can check that this also satisfies the heat equation. And the proof is pretty much um, the same as in the usual Gaussian case. Everything is pretty much the same as in the usual Gaussian case. That's why uh, we call it, it's called the fermionic Gaussian. Uh, so if you uh, want to uh, compute, say, uh, this um, fermionic Gaussian convolution, well, that is equivalently given by taking the exponentials of um, um, this operator LC acting on F, where LC is kind of like a Laplacian. So that is, you take the sum over XY and then the C XY and then D D uh, Psi X D Psi bar Y. Um, so if you replace this LC by the Laplacian C I introduced earlier, this is the heat equation property of the Gaussian convolution. Uh, this looks pretty much the same. This looks like a Laplacian. Um, so, so again, this uh, satisfies the heat equation. You can define uh, the Pochinsky equation, uh, the, um, um, uh, um, the renormalized potential, et cetera. And you can also see from this that you have this convolution property. So if you take uh, F and you add to psi, say, uh, psi one plus psi two, um, uh, that is the same as doing two expectations stations, one was uh, C1 and one was C2, maybe. The order doesn't matter, but I always prefer to put the first one to the right because that's the one that gets done first. Oops, sorry. I... So here we only have one. So this is the convolution property of Gaussian measures. Again, holds exactly the same way. Um, so uh, the upshot is, formally, everything is identical. up to a few signs you pick up to the, gonna write bosonic for the ordinary Gaussian case because um, that's uh, customary in this uh, context uh, to the bosonic uh, case can define renormalized potential and so on. Um, but, um, well, everything looks identical formally, but actually it's much better. <laughs> and why is it much better? Um, the reason it's much better is, uh, 
the following uh, inequality for uh, determinants. It's a version of uh, Graham's inequality. What does it say? If you start with a vector space, say V with inner product, So uh, V is an inner product space. Well, then uh, you can bound the determinant of a Gram matrix, which is uh, given by you taking vectors uh, UI, VI, you're taking the inner product and taking, say, I, J from one to P. You take the determinant of this. This is bounded by the product from I is equal to one to P of the norms of UI. VI, and these are the inner product norms. Uh, so, um, Roland, just you mean UI VJ, I guess, right? Uh, Left hand side. Yes, UI VJ, exactly. Yeah. So, really, this is the, um, so this is Graham's inequality. I'm not going to prove it, but you can look up a proof. Um, there's actually a nice one in Manfred Salmhofer's uh, book on renormalization and some appendix, I think. There's a very nice proof there. Um, 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 Joel Feldman also has some nice natural notes on this. Um, anyway, this is, uh, this is the essential fact that makes fermions much easier than uh, bosons. Um, why is that? Um, uh, so this inequality, so if you had a permanent on the left-hand side rather than a determinant, uh, this is not true. And uh, so let me just reformulate uh, this lemma uh, in terms of the um, um, uh, fermionic Gaussian expectation. So assume C is positive definite as, as I did earlier. Well, then it says that if you take the Gaussian moment, fermionic Gaussian moment, say of product of P, uh, psi xi, psi yi, well, this is bounded by the product from i is equal to one to P of say C x i x i, C y i y i uh, to the one half. And um, and the proof is, is more or less immediate from Graham's inequality. Um, you just take us in our product, um, the, the one defined by the covariance C. So that the by, since it's positive definite, that defines an inner product like this. So this curly bracket is the standard inner product, say, and then the, these angle brackets are the inner product with C. Um, So that, that is an inner product. So we can apply Graham's inequality. The left-hand side of the claim is, well, by the, by the fermionic Wick formula, it's this uh, determinant. Um, which you can write as the determinant of the Gram matrix um, delta xi uh, delta yj with respect to the above inner product. So Gram's inequality just imply, implies that this is bounded by the product of uh, the norms of delta xi delta y i. Um, and uh, well, that is the right-hand side. Um, so Graham's inequality implies that you can bound moments of the fermionic Gaussian in this way. So just in terms of the product of the covariances on the diagonal. So say if the covariance is uniformly bounded, it's just uh, some constant to the p. And but to appreciate what this bound says, you should compare it to the naive bound 
So if I had not told you about Graham's inequality, uh, well, there are a lot of smart people in the audience. Uh, people may have used the Graham's inequality or something equivalent to start with, but I would have uh, started with the following naive bound. Um, which is, well, we're looking at the determinant. Well, we plug in the definition, which involves a sum over sigma in, in the permutation group. Um, then I would have put absolute values into the sum because that's the easy thing to do. Um, I guess there's a product here. Yes, did I write this correctly up here? No, I did. Um, well, and then I would have, uh, well, the number of permu at this point, all you can do is take the number of permutations, which is p factorial. And then maybe you have a maximum over um, xi and yi of um, cxi, yj um, to the p. Um, now, how do these bounds compare? Well, in the cases that, that uh, we're interested in or that we will use this for, um, these two terms, there's not much difference between the two yellow terms. But there's a huge difference between the p factorial in the second bound and no p factorial in the first bound. Um, so what happened? Um, well, the minus one to the p's, which seemed like a nuisance, um, they're actually extremely helpful. Um, uh, they're responsible for the cancellations that get rid of the p factorial. Um, note that the naive computation I did, I would have just worked as well for bosonic variables, so ordinary Gaussian moments. You get the p factorial growth of these Gaussian moments um, in this way, by just summing over permutations is the minus one to the p's aren't there to help. They don't, there are no cancellations, but here there are the cancellations and the p factorial goes away. Um, uh, maybe one way to emphasize the message of this is that fermions behave like bounded random variables rather than uh, unbounded ones. So if you take moments of bounded random variables, well, you don't have p factorial factors, right? Uh, so the p factorial uh, comes from the fact, uh, I mean, it comes from the tail, um, right? If, if you just take bound, bounded, you, um, you just bound by the, by the maximal size uh, to the number of, to the power p. So the p factorial comes from the, from these Gau from the Gaussian tail, which, sound, which seems like a, uh, um, um, well, it seems like Gaussian variables are pretty closely bounded, but not nearly bounded uh, enough uh, for, for these purposes because uh, the, the p factorial is a huge difference, right? We, we saw uh, in the example that showed that, well, this ex, well, the non analytic t example, this one, lesson two, I mean, the non analyticity equivalently is related to the growth of these moments. Now, if you did the, the same thing with fermionic variables, well, if you just do a single field, well, you see, I mean, it's just a linear function anyway, so there's no um, problem in, of non-analyticity, but even our arbitrary number of dimensions, you'll see uh, roughly speaking where here, there was an n factorial squared, um, you will only get an n factorial rather than n factorial squared. And that gets canceled by the one over n factorial out front. Mm -hmm. So everything is nice and analytic in the fermionic context while there are difficulties in the bosonic one. So th this is really the reason why uh, fermionic RG 
is much simpler than uh, bosonic uh, renormalization. Um, um, uh, in, in some sense, even um, if you haven't seen this before, it may seem strange, uh, fermions are much nicer. Um, so so that, that was a little digression on uh, fermionic variables. Um, I will uh, next um, go back to a more general context where um, it doesn't matter whether you have bosonic or fermionic variables, uh, but we'll get to a point where um, you'll or it'll, we'll see that uh, some properties are much easier to get for exactly this reason if you use fermionic variables rather than bosonic ones. Um, and um, so that, that would be the next um, section where I will um, explain what is, um, I can maybe start with a, um, um, so we have about 10 minutes left. I can, I can start with um, uh, the, the first uh, bit, um, which is a little bit uh, disconnected. So this is about the, the finite range approach um, uh, to the renormalization. And it's one, um, this is essentially, uh, so we saw the three lessons uh, earlier today, and this is essentially about the problem of how to deal with the uh, one way, how to deal with the infinite volume, the uh, divergencies or the infinite volume problem, how to get estimates uniformly in the volume, even though it looked like the Taylor ex uh, expansion has, has a bad, um, volume dependence. So how to localize. And um, so I guess I can add a photo here again. Um, I guess uh, I don't want the camera. Um, oops, sorry about that. <laughs> so photo library here. So maybe, um, so this is an approach that uh, in particular, it's a simplification over many uh, over many related ideas that have been developed by many, but um, this is this particular approach was in particular uh, promoted by David Bridges. Um, and um, the starting point is um, The starting point is that we uh, do not decompose the uh, Green's function in an arbitrary way. Remember in the first lecture, I presented five different ways. You can use a heat kernel, you can use a, a Green's, fu Green's function with a sliding mass. Uh, uh, you can use other uh, methods um, that each have their certain nice properties. In, in this approach, um, um, the property we want to exploit is um, the finite range property. So. Uh, we want to say decompose as uh, a resolvent into um, an integral of uh, covariances CT dot uh, with the property that, well, we always need that CT dot is positive definite, that, that we always need because uh, we want to define a corresponding Gaussian measure with it. And uh, for that, we need it to be positive definite. So that, that's always uh, necessary. But then we want the property that uh, the finite range property that CT dot, dot is exactly zero if say the difference between X and Y is bigger than T. And in practice, we also want that it's approximately scale invariant. Now, if you only want approximately zero rather than exactly zero, any of the decompositions I wrote down would do, well, most of them anyway, uh, to get to be exactly zero may seem like a small difference. Um, you have to be a bit careful when doing this because it's, um, um, it's somehow a property that is in competition with the other properties that you need to have. Positive definite, if you go to Fourier space, means it's positive in Fourier space. 
this finite range property is a, is a property in real space. So you have simultaneous constraints in Fourier space and real space. And you can imagine uh, that um, it's not obvious that you can satisfy them both at the same time. It turns out this property uh, uh, you can satisfy in the interesting examples at the same time. Uh, and it's a helpful simplification for a lot of things. I don't think there's anything that you couldn't do with this uh, without this property, but it simplifies a lot of things uh, quite a bit. And any simplification is is uh, is uh, is appreciated in this context. And let me quickly, in the last five minutes, tell you how how you can do such a decomposition. Uh, so this is a little bit tangential to the further developments. So it doesn't. Um, really, um, um, I'm not going to use this construction later on, but let me just uh, show you how, how what you can do. Um, so one uh, one example would be, so this is not the one we're going to be interested in because we're going to be interested in the lattice. But if you're on the continuum, it's 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 rather easy to get such a decomposition because for any sufficiently integrable function f. Uh, well, you can simply write one over x to the d minus two, as which is the Green's function in the continuum, as some constant times the integral from zero to infinity, f of uh, absolute value of x over t times t to the d minus one um, dt. There's a minus here, which I think can. And uh, well. Why is that? Uh, why is that true? Well, this is simply true by a change of variable formula, right? You just change uh, t to t over x. The right hand side will just become a constant, which is one over this constant, and you get an explicit scaling factor out. Um, and uh, you can choose any function f in this identity. And if you choose f such that f of absolute value is positive definite. Uh, with compact support, uh, well, this gives a finite range decomposition as as desired. Um, now, this trick exploits the scale invariance, so it doesn't work on the lattice, say, and. It's not straightforward to, um, or it, it's not obvious uh, how to fix this, but it turns out there's a nice way to fix it. Because you can view um, this identity in uh, conceptually the following way. Well, the left hand side is the inverse Carol, of the Laplacian. Is, is there a simple, is there a simple explicit f which is positive definite with compact support? Or? Oh yeah, the, those ones are easy to to get. You can take say the standard bump functions and convolve it with itself. Okay, sure, thanks. Um, so that yeah, so that that second property is easy to get. Um, so the left-hand side is the inverse of the Laplacian, or the kernel, the inverse of the Laplacian. So something else you can do, which looks related to this, but actually is generalizes, is uh, where well, you can write this uh, spectral uh, decomposition formula for the inverse of the Laplacian. Um, uh, and uh, now take this function f, not the same as above, but you take f to have compact support in Fourier space. So f is a real value, is a function on the real line. You take it to have support, uh, the Fourier support in minus one, one. Um, um, you can also take a positive uh, by um, convolving the Fourier transform with itself, again, similar as, be as before. And this again gives a finite range decomposition because e to the i square root minus Laplacian t is the wave operator. And by the finite propagation speed property, um, It's a Schwartz kernel, or as an operator, it has uh, well, it has the compact has the 
finite has compact support property it vanishes if the two points you're looking at uh, are further away than t. Um, so since we're only taking integral from minus one to one, you'll get in, in this case, f of square root Laplacian is gonna be a smooth operator with support one. Um, so this gives another way to get the finite prop, uh, range decomposition. Um, And um, in this case, you can uh, uh, easily get a lattice analog by just using uh, uh, a discrete time wave equation, which is also exists and has nice properties. Um, um, and uh, this way you can obtain um, uh, one, uh, an analog that, that works uh, on the lattice. So say, for example, if we do take the lambda to be the Laplacian on ZD, uh, uh, then by using, using the above construction, but with a discrete uh, time wave equation, you can uh, construct uh, these uh, CT dot um, uh, um, in such a way. that the CT dot are positive definite. Uh, matrices. With the finite range property. Um, and um, they also are approximately scale invariant. For example, you can enforce this by asking that, say, the discrete derivatives decay uh, like, like they would in the continuum where you have exact scale invariance. That, that's really the kind of property that, um, uh, that is needed um, uh, as for approximate scale invariance for what we want to do. Um, okay, so uh, I think my time is up at this point. So I'll this, this was sort of a, a digression how to do this. Uh, next time I'll start, assuming we've decomposed this Gaussian measure in this finite range way, and then uh, try to uh, work out how to um, get around this infinite volume problem or how to get around, the, uh, well, how to get um, a way to uh, understand uh, the renormalized potential in a way that, uh, that is uniform in the volume. So, so that is what uh, what we'll do next time. Thank right. you. Thank you very much. Are there questions on the second part of uh, the class? I guess uh, fermions are really simple, so. <laughs> We yeah, understood everything. Very good. So um, we see each other on uh, Monday, uh, Tuesday. Sorry, Tuesday. Yeah. <laughs> Can I make sorry. a physics comment? So, so yes, please. You you said that fermions behave as finite range variables, but yes, from a physics perspective, we usually say that fermions behave as infinitesimal fields. Okay, I, I agree with, I also agree with that point of view. Yes. Um, uh, but it, that's also simpler, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's even simpler than finite range. <laughs> well, yeah. There should be I some mean, property here, which is even nicer than finite range. Okay, um, yeah, that, I think, uh, yeah, I agree that that's a good, um, good remark. Um, um, but Roland, when you meant bounded, you, you didn't mean finite range, right? Well, I mean, so here bounded. I meant, well, I, I think what Slava means by finite range is bounded, right? Uh, given yeah, that the values. Yeah, so, hmm. yeah, I mean, okay. here they're really bounded for the purpose of computing the moments, right? They behave as if they were bounded. And um, I, I guess 
computing the moments if they're infinitesimal, I mean, I guess that that's a slightly different point of view, uh, which will appear. Well, anyway, um, <laughs> for the purpose of the moments, they really look like bounded here. Okay. But they even, as Slava pointed out, they may be even better. <laughs> uh, Okay, very good. Thank you, Roland, and uh, we see each other on Tuesday. Thank you very much. Thank you.